So yeah, uh, today this session, cloud storage and what's the problem? Because um, cloud storage has a problem. The fact is that we're not using it. Um, show one on myself. Uh, I am as leader, Veeam EMEA evangelists. Uh, I'm not here as a Veeam representative today for this session. I'm here as a storage blogger. So that is my blog, that is my Twitter handle. I, um, I blog for a few years and the last Three years I have been very focused on storage because that was my job. Previously, I was um, working as pre-sales team lead for storage with a systems integrator, uh, focused on HP and Dell storage. So there's not that much that I don't know about HP and Dell storage. Um, they invite me to as a blogger, so I go to HP Discover Dell storage forum. Um, recently, last week, I got my first VMware vExpert. Thank you for that to the community. Um, a lot of it has to do with my new role at V. Uh, the people that know me don't know me like, um, as the picture that is uh, up there. Most of the people know me like this guy. Uh, I'm not your regular um, vendor representative. So why I want to talk uh, today, why I'm actually here is that I, I told you I'm a storage blogger, right? And this is, I don't know if you know this slide, this picture, it's from Greg Schultz. Mr. Storage I.O. It's a very nice slide where you actually see the difference in everything that is um, a storage I.O. from the very small, uh, very high I.O. intensive to very big files that have a very low uh, intensity. This is how it looks like in real life. You got one man in a race car or you got a whole boat. Um, the one is, has a lot of more volume but will travel a lot slower. Um, and they also have a very big difference in what they cost. Uh, last year, I was very much focused, if you go to my blog, you will see that I had a lot of blogs on the top about Flash. So I've been investigating, not investigating, really going, asking, uh, asking questions and going into all the different new kinds of Flash storage. Um, I was invited at Tech Field Day, uh, the storage Tech Field Day, where I met a lot of the new startups we learned a lot about Flash last year. And this year I wanted to focus a little bit more on that lowest uh, tier of storage. Might have something to do now with the company that I work for. Because we have a lot of volume of data that you're not using. Where can you put it? One of the, point, one of the places where you can put it is in the clouds. Um, so that is why we have this presentation here today. If we talk about, this is generic, this is a slide that always goes in, 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 in my slides. Uh, but it's a very important one. The basics of data protection is 3-2-1. Chris knows the 3 2, one rule. I don't know if any of you know him. Um, it's, it's not a Veeam rule. It's a generic data protection rule. Um, the 3 2, one is you always need three copies of your data. One in production, one as a backup, and at least one as a backup of the backup. Because when you are starting to recover something and something goes wrong, you need that extra copy. So uh, the second, this 3.2, is two media types. If you have, uh, for example, you have two copies on a storage replication, if something goes wrong on the left, nine out of 10 it goes wrong on the right. right? Um, even if you have, for example, a firmware upgrades. If a firmware upgrade goes wrong in the sand on the left, nine out of 10 it goes wrong on the sand on the right. So you need at least two media types of your data. One of them has to be offsite. So that is a 3 two, one rule. It doesn't matter which technology you're using, where you're doing your data protection, three copies of your data, two different media types, one of them has to be off-site. Uh, the agenda of today, why cloud, what cloud, where cloud, who cloud, wow, how, cloud, 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 cloud. Um, who is cloud storage? There's two types of cloud storage. The first one is this. I don't think anyone in the room is not using any of these types of storage. You all have at least one. I think the most common one for everyone would be Dropbox, um, because SharePoint is not that useful anymore today. Well, it might be, but not for everyone. It's very easy to share files with your coworkers through Dropbox. This type of storage, we call that consumer-graded cloud storage. Right? If there's consumer-graded cloud storage, they might all will also be enterprise-graded cloud storage. Uh, this might be discussable, but I think it's a fair um, a fair difference here that we make. Um, so I'm looking for two key differentiators. What are two key differentiators between the, consu the consumer-graded cloud storage 
and the enterprise grade of cloud storage. What do you think? Two key differentiators. Okay, I, I think one thing is uh, a feedback. Uh, what is German? What is English? Um, reliability. Well, the service. Yes, SLA. The quality of service. Yes, quality of service. SLA, SLA. is is one of them. Um, actually, I, I could go for three of them. Enterprise management. Uh, let's put that under SLA quality of service. Okay. Um, yeah. So SLA is one. Uh, cost is one that comes up very very common when I ask this question. Um, why do I mention cost here? And I will explain it more in detail a little bit later. Is that everyone thinks the top of them are free? Um, they're actually not because I pay for uh, Dropbox. I have 100 gig and I pay for it. So what is then the difference in cost? The difference in cost is that for Dropbox and the consumer grade the cloud storage, you only pay for the volume. You don't pay for anything else than volume. With and with all the others on the bottom, you will pay for volume, bandwidth, and tick in the box. And I will cover that with a, with a presentation here. So that was the second one. Um, so first of all, we have SLAs, quality of service. We have the cost difference. It's not free, but it is a cost difference. And the third one actually is um, languages. If you look at the top ones, they are all um, they are all applications that are already installed or that you install on your laptop. The bottom ones are uh, things that live in your enterprise application that you still need to design. So you will need to know the languages. For the consumer grade account service, you don't need to know anything yourself. It's been covered by what you already get there. I know in the background they're all using APIs, but for the, for the user, if you want to use cloud storage at the bottom, they don't have integrations themselves. They say, here's our API, do with it what you want. Um, and that actually... Uh, what you can. Hmm? <laughs> actually what you can. What you can, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, um, why cloud storage? There's a few points here. Natural disasters. Um, it, it's, it's, natural disasters actually is not only a floods or a fire. It's also um, in the room next door there was a sprinkler issue. It was a story I heard earlier this week. A sprinkler issue and the whole floor next door had water coming in. If, if the water comes in in your data center too. So that everything goes down. You, so let's call natural disaster a complete disaster of your infrastructure. Now, um, that's a, it's a very good thing that you have cloud storage then, because you can access it anytime, anywhere, anywho. I put anywho in light gray because it's also one of the challenges, anywho can access it. Um, flexibility. This is a very big uh, positive thing on cloud storage. I buy a few terabytes of storage, and if I need two more terabytes, it's just a tick in the box. As long as I have the credit card, it's a tick in a box. Within five minutes, you got two terabytes of extra storage. You cannot do that on your own infrastructure. So if you, it, it's the same like burst cap, burst cap capabilities for for compute. You have the burst capabilities for cloud too. I just need two terabytes extra. Tick in the box. Uh, give the credit card, and you're done. Now there's also a few of the negative parts here. Um, connectivity is one. Cloud storage is. By definition, on the other side of the connection, I don't have a connection, I cannot access. Um, vendor login, I think this is a very important one. It's, you cannot just move cloud storage from one vendor to another. That is a big challenge in my eyes. Noise risk and service level. Um, what I mean with this is if you work together with a local cloud storage provider, someone that gives you what we have, a very big open stack uh, installation, we will provide you with cloud storage. Um, if there is in a natural disaster in your in your city, <coughs> and those those providers they always have the option that you can just come in and ask for the disks. Right? They move your data from their storage to a, to a portable disk, and then you can have all your disks. Well, if there isn't, if there is a big disaster in your city, there will be a thousand cars on a data center waiting for their disk. So that's what I mean with the noisy neighbor. You are never alone there. So what is the service level that you get here? Can they really tell me that you will get your USB with all your data within a, an amount of hours? Yes, if you are alone, not if everyone comes in at the same time. So that is a challenge. And security, of course, any who can access from anywhere. Now, let's come back to the cost. And this is really why I want to show that difference. 
Uh, I use Amazon S3 here as a first example. Um, I went through all the ticks in the boxes and told you what it costs. So you will pay for volume. And the volume costs for the general S3 with uh, multi-site redundancy, $100 per terabyte. Gives you 11 nines, right? Um, and that, but what, what also happens is that you all, you don't, you're not only paying for the volume, you're also paying for every request that your API gives. Now, this is a lot of requests. 200,000 requests is $1. Well, it, it's because, and we'll go down, your files are divided by chunks, objects, however you want to call it, and those are the requests that come in. So you will pay for every request that comes in or goes out. And another thing that you pay for is bandwidth. Okay, So you will pay extra for the bandwidth. If you just move your storage, so data transfer in is free. It's not free, right? You're paying it here. Okay, you're paying. You you do not pay for bandwidth when you put the data there. No, you put for the volume that you bring in extra. But you will pay if you want to retrieve the data. Okay, you will pay for the amount of requests to retrieve it, and you will pay for the bandwidth that it takes. Okay, putting it there if you will never use it will be the cheapest way. And therefore, you have this example. They also have Glacier. Look at the price difference. It's one in ten price difference for the same volume. And the prices of requests and data transfer are the same for Glacier and S3. Where's the difference here? Where's the difference from the same provider giving you the same amount of storage for one-tenth of the price? Anyone knows what the difference is? It's about the, the bandwidth available, right? No. You fetch it? It's about the SLA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, can you read this one? How long does it take for jobs to complete? Most of the jobs will take between three to five hours to complete. This is not an SLA. Most of. This is not an SLA. An SLA is you will get your data back within this. So this is why it is so cheap. You'll have to give in a request. It's, if you look at S3, this is active data, in, out, while you're doing it, right? For, uh, for Glacier, you will have to provide a comment and ask for them to bring it back. And they will bring it back to you within three to five hours. That is the difference why they can make it so cheap. It's just on very cheap storage, on storage that is spinned down. They need to spin up the storage that you need. No one knows what the hardware is beyond that. A lot of them thought that it was tape. Apparently, there's no tape involved. It would be spin down this, but they're not um, giving you the details on that. I don't know if you know anything more. I think I'm not lying here. So I provided also the second example, Windows Azure. Same thing, you, you can slide the amount of storage, whether you want to have it geographically redundant or locally redundant, the prices will be different. You see that the prices are not that different between Amazon and Azure. Uh, but in Azure, they don't, they're not telling you if you have to pay for bandwidth. I don't think so. I haven't found it. Um, so yeah, this is about the difference in cost. You're not only paying for volume, you're also paying for the SLA, but you're also paying for bandwidth and the tick in the box in your application. Now, why don't we get it? And this is why we don't get it. Cloud storage is object storage, and we do not understand object storage. Why don't we understand it? I'll give it, this is basics about storage. What is the first example? Block storage, it's your operating, your application gives a file to the operating system, asking the operating system to write it in SCSI command to the disk. Second type, we put in a few more disks, we put a RAID on top of it, like a local RAID, and you, you get the exact same thing. You have a, it looks like a local disk to the operating system. The application gives a file to the operating system, SCSI commands coming into the RAID. The next step, of course, is building an array around it. Now, we're still doing the exact same thing. You get a disk that looks local, but we just wrap a few uh, network, well, actually, uh, block network packets around it, and we're still moving SCSI commands to a disk that looks locally. What's a filer? Well, the exact same thing, but we just wrap instead of fiber channel or iSCSI protocols, we, uh, we put uh, SMB or NFS packets around that same SCSI. So it's still the application giving the file to the operating system, writing it in SCSI down to 
disks somewhere on, an, on, an, on another location. The difference in object is that it's not the operating system anymore. It's the application writing through an API instead of a network protocol through an API must to be REST, Swift, S3, so there's a, a few more in there, I guess. Um, but the, the biggest challenge here is that we don't, we don't see this. I'm an infrastructure guy. I don't see what you are doing. Why don't I see it? Everything that you're doing is hidden between HTTP, HTTPS packages. Yes. Actually, it's when you, when you implement object storage. What I did, I did it on Swift. Huh? And when you look into the object, that means when you put something inside, you use your Firefox over this dashboard and you put files, you will see them. Yeah, but not the files. You will not see file. You, will, you cannot extract file out of it. Yeah, it's you actually... See, you see the objects, but you, you can't object? do anything with, the, with an object. Yeah, you, you can do anything with it. Yeah. You, you can see that it's there. Yeah, Okay. The object, but you can't actually, see... Actually, when it's one thing, <laughs> when you have two, two millions, you can, will not be able to find exactly. the object which you serve. You need someone to tell you these objects together are a file. Yeah. Yeah. But you always need an application here. You need the application that talks to the storage through the APIs. The operating system as such, without an application, cannot see what is in there. Why not? Because it doesn't know all the languages. The operating system doesn't know REST, Swift, S3, so it doesn't know. So that is the big challenge for infrastructure guys like myself. I'm not an application guy. So if I want to use object storage, I will need some kind of language knowledge. Um, I am Belgian and I speak Dutch, French, English and a little German. I do not speak Chinese, Russian, um, South African. So the challenge here is how many languages do they need to give us? Right? How many languages do I need to learn? And this is where I go back to that um, vendor looking. You cannot you simply cannot learn so many languages to be... Because here, it's not a problem, right? It's the problem of the operating system. If you change from SMB to NFS or to ISCOSI or Firechat, it doesn't... For the application, it doesn't matter. It's just the operating system will take care of it. This is the application that needs to take care of it. So if you want to change your application from working with Amazon to working with Azure, you will need to change your entire language. That, for me, is a big challenge in vendor locking. Um, do, you so, think, do you think that's just OS developers have been slow to adopt? Personally? No, I think there's just way too many languages now, and there's, there's no... There's, not everyone is saying, oh, we need to do everything on Swift, or we need to do everything on REST. <laughs> Okay, this is something that will grow. This is why we don't get it today. This is everyone. It, everyone knows that object is the future. Object really is the future because of the scale out that you can have behind object. We just don't know today what the, which of these will be the, the the best one to use. Okay, uh, and and by the way, this is uh, this is a language, but there's a lot of dialects in the language. Right? It's a type of language, and you could even make your own RESTful APIs, right? So it's, it's not open. It's not an open standard. If, if, if it ever becomes an open standard, then we will, we will no longer have the challenge, okay? So languages really is an issue. Now, what is object storage as such? I hope everyone really get the, we will get through this one very fast, but it's, it's a growing slide deck for me. Um, so you have an object, object is a piece of a file, a chunk of a file, that gets some metadata. Now metadata is the important thing of objects, okay? You get a few blocks of I.O., but what is that, you could put as many attributes as you want on top of that file, and an example here is actually in my, this is integrated in my file system in, 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 in Mac. Um, if you look at the, um, the attributes of that picture on my hard drive, there is the size of the picture, RGB, uh, alpha and where I originally downloaded it. This has nothing to do with storing files in an operating system. Operating systems shouldn't know this. I like it that they integrated it, but they should. these are things that are not common. This has nothing to do with storing a file. These are attributes, and you give your own attributes. I could 
there's, if you go into Flickr, for example, Flickr will also tell you what, which camera you took it, or which, what firmware was on your camera. You could put as many metadata on that object as you want. The, 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 the next part is that that object with its metadata gets a key. And that's the, key. that's the only thing you get back. You do not know where the object system will store your files. It's not in a slash slash server slash slash share slash slash folder. No, it's just um, this is the bucket. Well, the bucket comes here. It's the name. It's just the URL. And give me my ticket back. And this is where a lot of people um, show you that. This is a good example of that. You go to a restaurant and you give your, your car keys to the valet and the valet gives you a ticket. And with that ticket, you can come back and ask for your car. You do not know where they stored your car. If it's on the first floor or the fifth floor, no, you just ask or to the valet, give me my car back. Okay. This is the analogy a lot of people use to tell you the, the key. Okay, I just go to the entrance of the hotel and I give the valet my ticket. That is that is how it how you could um, how you could uh, compare this. Now all these objects together are in a bucket. Right? The bucket is um, bacon.hands.com, and there you will put all the objects in, and that is where you put your token. Right? You you ask for you give your key to the bucket, and the bucket will retrieve your objects. You can have multiple buckets inside your uh, storage account. This is like the basics of how um, Amazon S3 uh, uses their, their, their objects, how they store it. Now if you go, this is, where, yeah, this is again to the languages. Look at this, right? If you, this is only to access. The first line that you need to know is only to authenticate myself. And the second one is where I have that token. This is the token of the object that I'm asking here, right? I give a, a path of where my original file is with a description. This is the token. Yeah? If I need it back, that's the file I need. If you look, this is now, um, I think it's Glacier. Uh, that is SOAP, if I'm not wrong. Um, if you're using OpenStack, it would be Swift. It would be a completely different line of code. And that is a challenge that we have between that vendor walking. I would have to change everything in code if I change from one vendor to another uh, uh, according to the language that they're speaking. And these are not open standards, right? These are something you make. Yes. Funny how you can, but it's not easy, but you can. Put over Swift, you can put this S3 interface. Yeah, they, they have an emulator now. It, not all functionality, but I, I think you, you can use a lot of this, the, the, how to say, file manager for S3. Yes, to I know. But the problem is that in your API, there might be a lot of uh, options that are not possible yes. in the other API. Right. So there might be a possibility to move from one to the other, but you would never be able to move back yet because you're adding attributes that are not available on the other side. Yeah, right. of course. So as long as we do not have an open standard on the APIs, vendor blocking will be there. And it's up to you as a user, if I want to use it, how open can I be? Do I need to learn more languages or am I okay with using Amazon only or using uh, a few of them that you, OpenStack for example would be, would be a good standard because a lot of them are integrating in OpenStack. But it's not, an, it's not the standard today. Uh, but it, it might go there. So learning the different, the different languages is a big challenge and it's, in my eyes, one of, the, one of the big reasons why we're not using it today. Now this is how... Um, so you saw the buckets, right, in, in, uh, in Amazon. This is how Azure puts their objects together. They have three types of uh, storage containers. Um, the first one is Blob. Um, blob is with um, blocks of four megabytes uh, for block blobs. I mean, I, I, I really, uh, there's so many names in here. I mean, no. So you have block blobs and you have page blobs. What's the difference? One of the differences here is that it has bigger chunks, the block, it's a, four, a maximum four megabyte. You could change it. Um, but what happens here with, with, a, with a block, it has to commit or discard the block. So I will send the four megabytes, and I will have to commit the four megabytes when I when I done sending it. With pages, it's different. 
you move 512 bytes and it's auto committed. Right? That is already a difference here in the type of object storage that you're using. Use cases, um, images, and for us, for example, um, we use it uh, in our backup storage. We use the block blobs for backup and disaster recovery, right? Um, because it makes sense to move bigger files than, than to do page um, updates on, on that type. Data analysis would then more use 512 bytes. They would use pages. The second type of storage that you can use in Azure is tables. And I, don't, I think that everyone knows how a data, database looks like. This is for having, for example, a remote database using with your application. So think that you have a, a SQL client application. It writes SQL commands to the tables in the SQL database. This is what you're doing, but just over HTTPS to the cloud. You're doing updates of a record, you, you will make new tables, you will create new, uh, new lines. So this makes more sense for structured data, simple data sets. Uh, so yeah, that's a very big difference. If you are a SQL guy, there is no joint store procedures in the cloud. Really. Okay, this is just, if you can make, you can use tables as a simple structured database uh, for a simple solution. So don't compare it to SQL, please. Um, and then there's queues. Queues is, um, for example, if you have um, a web server in, in, in one and you have an application in the other and you want to do um, a, a complete set of log files that you need to move from one to another, you will make a queue of all the commands. Every log that comes in is a new queue. Well, no, it goes into the queue and at a certain point you will move the whole queue to the other side. So these are three types of Azure. This is completely different as how Amazon <coughs> did their buckets. So this is only two examples. If you look to OpenStack, it will be another completely different set of how you sort. I actually haven't uh, gone into how they sort, but I think it's, it's going to be different as what, what we see here, or we saw in, in the Amazon with the buckets. Uh, they don't do buckets. You have objects, yeah. Yeah, and objects are... Uh, uh, okay. Actually, tenants objects and account. That's how they do it. And that's three stages. <coughs> Object is definitely that what 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 what, what <coughs> where the, the where the the objects are stored. If it's bigger than five gigabyte, get two objects. Yeah. objects. These are also uh, by the way oh, sorry. This uh, these that block that page um, that entity these are also objects, right? These are all, the only difference here is that it is a different type of object. And okay. you know that they are compared to a Word file or an Excel file. They're both files, the one is Word, the other one is Excel. Objects are connected to account uh, or, or okay. To, to account which is actually one container. You know, and, okay, bucket. You can container. compare it with a bucket, yeah. yeah it's, it's just container. a different name. Yeah, yeah. Container here you see that it's a completely different architecture mm -hmm. than just having bucket okay, generally for anything that comes in. Open source and open source. Open stack is Actually, I, I will say copy of S3. Okay. I will say. I'll quote you on that. <laughs> yeah, you can say it like I this. Know, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so, um, and there's one last thing. I said the anywho is a challenge. Well, there are options you can encrypt. There's two types of things that you can encrypt. You can encrypt the file as such. On top of that, you could also encrypt the entire file name because you know. The, you only need the key. They don't need to know what is inside the object. You're writing the object. I can encrypt those block files. They just need to write down ones and zeros with the metadata. And the metadata in this thing is just only the key, right? So if I go into my Azure, uh, it was not bucket, but container, and I look to my files, these are my files. I don't think you could do anything with it because you don't even know that there are backup files. This could be a GPAC, this could be a complete uh, PST file, nobody knows that you can't do anything with it. It's 256 um, AES encryption. So the, you can make it secure. The only thing you need to know is if you want to take it with you on another side, you will need your encryption keys. Okay. So this is actually, um, this is the start. I'm, I'm, you see that I'm not finished with this slide deck. This is a growing thing. But do you get the fact that, did I say a few things that make sense for you, right? Are, yeah. Are there any questions, insights, rants, 
Is, is any of you besides Sasha looking at cloud storage, public cloud storage then? No. What? No. As in, yeah. give you a use case? Storing um, disaster recovery machines or backups on, on the cloud. Okay. Or even running. Uh, and what are you using for that? No, no, I'm, we are planning. Okay. We are analyzing your product. Um, Thank you. And <laughs> And also studying doing it by ourselves using the APIs. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it's it's let's, a early stage. Okay. Yeah. We need to talk about that because we have an integration, and that's actually where the original slide deck came a little bit from. We have a cloud edition integration where we talk all those languages. But what we do there, the, the difference is that you put whole files in a public cloud. The problem is that you need, if it's, if it's big files like a backup, you move the whole file. If something happens in between, you will have to move the file again, right? Um, our newest version in version 7, uh, what we do there differently is that we need compute on the other side. If we have compute on the other side and on our side, we could actually look at the blocks. And we will not move the blocks that you don't need. So if you have your backup already once on the other side, you will only have to move the differentiating blocks. Okay? It is a challenge when you do it just with big backup files to the other side. It really is a challenge today. Um, because, yeah, you, you'll need to commit the whole file at the end. If something happened in between, the whole file is gone, you need to move it again. So that is a challenge. Cloud search is a challenge. Use case? Um, uh, yeah, I, was, I was looking at for an SMB, um who wants to replace uh, a legacy file server and where my first thought was, oh, I'll just put a NAS for them. Um, I'm just looking at like the CD type solution mm -hmm. where you, know, you have a kind of a lightweight appliance with very little local storage, just local cache. Yes. And that then plugs into AWS. And they move the cold the data of site. And so that acts as a kind of like the hot cache and they do the dejuke, so you're yeah. reducing your bandwidth transfers. Uh, and the actual a good example in, in that type of is also a store simple that got bought by, uh, by Microsoft. They do the exact same thing. You, they, you, get you get 100 terabytes and only one or two terabytes is on site. Exactly. It's actually only your hot cache. And, 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 it runs up. and you don't see that. Between your blocks yeah. and, and your file share. So they, they share or you know, your NFS share. And then they do the they do yes. the and they, they move it to into objects right. yeah outside and you don't see that as a user exactly. in your internet you see local 100 terabytes of which yeah. you do not know that 95 terabytes of it is in the cloud yeah. and that's actually the type of integrations where you need to know those languages if I want to translate objects to network file files that are in a network share you need to translate that. And that translation is not happening today in the operating system. You'll need an appliance for that, or you will need an application for that. Okay. Sasha, you want to add something? No, okay. How, how many time do we have? I don't care. No, okay. It's I think we minutes. actually have 10 or 15 minutes if you want to. Okay, I, you know, I don't you, want you to... You can talk for 10 or 15 minutes. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the last session, so we can do anything. No, what, what, okay, we will have next session, actually, about uh, pizza and yeah, yeah, yeah. where well, the future is. We and, and, and all the stuff. Okay, in my opinion, it's actually the problem that, that, that uh, as you said, the, the IT industry, what we have on, on the side, Windows and all this, all this operating system, which, which actually are all, almost more than 20 years old, they are not aware of objects in any way. And that means you have a file system, and you, they don't know file system, and that's what they know. I think that the only way to, to today, maybe it will be different, to, to, to provide cheap storage for not fast changing data is actually object storage. Yes. You, you don't have any other opportunity. Okay, you can do it, as you say, you can also buy a 2000 flash disk and do this, yeah? but that will be too expensive and, and, and not, not even efficient in any way. That means the only way is to do some kind of object store. And, okay, you can do it on your own, you use OpenStack or you can... Actually, OpenStack is the only solution I know that actually has object store in kind of way. What do you mean with that? It means when you, when you do, for example, Eucalyptus, they don't give a bother what, where you store the data. That's actually your problem. Huh? Yeah. Actually, the other, the other product which I know is the uh, cloud stack as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, those, are, those are platforms. Yeah, yeah. There, are, there are object storage solutions, 
that are already built on top of some. I, I think I'm thinking about Ampli Data. Um, Castor, for example, is an old one. They they never found okay, but market, but those are object stores that have been there for quite some years. Okay, but if you want to do it on your own, yes, then, okay? yeah. you have actually uh, actually only you solution. Need, you you need OpenStack for that. Yeah, now so, today. Now today it's only solution. Okay, except that's what what, what yeah. I told. It's actually something which all so of us. Nexenta is coming there yeah. somewhere, but they will use probably OpenStack too. Yeah. Who knows? I, yeah. Yeah, okay, but that is one project which I, I, I look actually every two to three months. Yeah. What's happened there? Because what they want is they want one storage where you have block devices, where you have object file. store, and where you have file servers. Yeah. In one storage, which is actually from an architecture point of view, it means put the server, put the community server inside with a lot of this, and, and if you need more, simply put more. And that's I, actually, I think, if, if they deliver what, what they want to, yeah. uh, that will be actually future. But uh, at the end, I think it will be, like I just said, we need it for now, this, this storage for, yeah. uh, for file, but when the operating system gets the wearable object, I think we will have all the objects. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, today, it's, it's very challenging to get into um, OpenStack or Ceph. Uh, you will need companies that really know already the languages and stuff. I, I'm thinking about InkTech, gives yeah. enterprise support on Ceph technology. You will need integrators like that because we just, we don't have a clue today. We know how, how SCSI works and we know how all the packets around SCSI work, whether or over network or water block. We have no clue what happens on the other side. And that is for me, like I said, that was the biggest challenge. Yeah. I think we're good. We can, you want to, no, if somebody actually, I what I want, I want to say, if somebody is really interested, in it, uh, I, I want to try, uh -huh. and, and I have a question. I, what I what I really suggest try, simply try. It's easy to install. Oh, okay, it's easy to install. I will say to install. It's actually easy, and the storage as such will work at very beginning. When you start every service, the storage will work. At that actually easy to, to get. But how, how are you consuming this, this open stack storage that you told us about? Okay, what we do, we are still, okay, what we want is we have to, we have one potential customer on one project that we want to get to. The, the potential customer has a really problem, he has statical data. You know, every few months the planes are going over North, North Germany and make pictures. Yeah? You know, every and, and they have a lot of these pictures. Yeah? Yeah. What they do now actually is also kind of unstructured big files. Actually, what they do now, they have <coughs> USB disk, and they have it on it, and they have like a room full of USB disk. And when they when they when they when, when they search for something, if they have to yeah. search, they go and then they have a catalog of these USB disks. Okay, then they try to buy storage. Okay. They say, okay, it's, it's pain in the ass, cost also money. You know, you have you have to have two people which know where, where it is when, when you set something, yeah. And then they decide to make project out of it, and they do that. But they are about two million. I, I told this that was the project I, I showed last time. That's, they are about two millions in cost. Okay, we saw, told them, okay, what we can do for you is I, to do this on, 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 on this way. Okay, it's two possibilities. You, we can use API. And, and integrate in, 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 and we must integrate in, in the application which yeah. you have, yeah. or it's simple. You get one web website where they all are. It's actually still better than, than now. But now it's like the new USB disk yeah. connected to the software. A, you, you just you simply cannot store one billion pictures in a folder structure. You simply cannot store that. You you need a very scalable, and it doesn't matter where the picture is, right? I don't. I don't want. To, I don't want to put my pictures of my family trip to Paris two weeks. Ago. I went to Disneyland with my kids. I don't want to store them anymore under D backslash 2013 backslash May backslash week four and then Disneyland. This doesn't make sense. No. The only thing is that in the metadata of the picture, it will say Disneyland 27th of May 2013. That's enough. Yeah, okay, that's actually, uh, okay, the second thing what we really want to do, we have a lot of customers which, um, how to say, they, uh, they cannot do backup on their own. They do this, we have a few times, you know, they do backup, 
they have a discipline to let they do this, yeah? You say every day tape and then crash comes. Just talking. And then crash come, yeah? And <laughs> you find out they never control this data which on this. <laughs> 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 okay. It's good.